Hello, and welcome to Elevator Pitch Series for the Radiographer. I am Michael, and this is the third video in the series on radiographic equipment. In this video, we'll be learning how X-ray photons are produced and how they interact with matter. X-rays are a type of electromagnetic waves. Other types of electromagnetic waves include the waves coming from broadcasting stations to our televisions and radios, the inferred waves that our remote controls use, light waves and so on. What makes X-rays different from these other forms of electromagnetic waves is that they have a shorter wavelength and a higher frequency. These two properties give X-rays the ability to ionize matter. This means that they can eject electrons from atoms that they interact with, a process known as ionization. This is why you've most likely heard of X-rays being called ionizing radiation. It is through these ionization interactions that the X-rays are used in diagnostic radiography to produce images of the anatomy that they pass through. Now, how are these X-ray photons produced? In the next video, we learn about the various components of an X-ray tube and their different functions. For now, let us take note of two important components. The X-ray tube is a diode. This means that it has a negatively charged cathode and a positively charged anode. Now, when current is applied to the filament of the cathode, the filament gets hot and starts to release electrons. The released electrons are driven by a potential difference, also known as a kilovoltage, from the cathode, where they are released, to a spot on the anode, known as the focal spot. When the electrons hit the focal spot, the energy of these electrons is converted to X-ray photons. This is the basis of X-ray photon production. However, the conversion of electron energy to X-ray photons can happen in two ways. The first way of X-ray photon production is the production of Bromstrahlung X-rays. This process occurs between the electron that is released from the cathode filament and the nucleus of an atom on the anode focal spot. This diagram gives an overview of the entire process. Let us look at it in a bit more detail. I should warn you, it is an elaborate process and may seem overwhelming, but is actually very easy once you understand it. As you can see on the diagram, the electron is attracted towards the nucleus of the target atom. The nucleus has a certain force field surrounding it, and as the electron gets close to the nucleus, this force field suddenly slows down the electron, like how a brake slows down a moving car. This breaking of the electron will cause it to deflect or change in direction. As it does this, a portion of its energy is given off as an X-ray photon. The energy of the X-ray photon that is produced is equal to the energy of the incoming electron, minus the energy of the electron that is deflected and eventually leaves the anode atom. At this point, pause the video and take a minute to look at the diagram while going over the explanation we just gave, this will help you understand it better. Are you done with that? Let's move on. Take note that the closer the electron gets to the nucleus and its force field, the greater the energy of the X-ray photon it gives off. This means that the electron can either pass at a distance from the nucleus and produce a photon with low energy, or it can pass close to the nucleus and produce a photon with higher energy, or it can even get absorbed completely by the nucleus, in which case all of the electron's energy will be converted to X-ray photon, producing a photon with very high energy. What this means is that an incoming electron can have multiple interactions with atoms of the anode, producing different photons of different energies. An electron can interact with an anode atom, pass far away from the nucleus, give off some of its energy as a photon, deflects out of the atom, interacts with another atom, gives off energy again, and so on. All these leads to photons produced by this method having different energies. This is why it is said that Bromstrahlung photons are in a heterogeneous spectrum. What do we mean by the statement from Strahling X-ray photons are in a heterogeneous spectrum? If for a certain exposure, a radiographer selects a kilovoltage of 59, the photons produced due to Bromstrahlung interactions will not have the same energy, they will be heterogeneous. One photon could possess 59 kV, the other 58, another 53, and it keeps varying like that due to the multiple interactions that occur. This is what a heterogeneous spectrum means. That takes us to the second type of X-ray photon production. The production of characteristic X-ray photons. This time, the process occurs between the released filament electron and an electron that is orbiting the K-shell of an atom on the anode focal spot. We split the steps that occur in this process into separate diagrams, please follow. First, the electron released from the cathode filament ejects an electron that is orbiting the K-shell of the anode's atom. This causes a vacancy to be created in the K-shell. This vacancy is then filled by an electron that is orbiting the outer L-shell of the anode's atom. 
As this vacancy is being filled, energy is giving off in the form of an X-ray photon. This time, the energy of the X-ray photon produced is equal to the binding energy of the K-shell, minus the binding energy of the L-shell. We should also point out that there is a condition for characteristic X-ray photon production to occur. The electron coming from the cathode filament must have an energy that is equal to or greater than the binding energy of the K-shell electron that it wants to eject. The most commonly used material for anode targets is tungsten. The K-shell of tungsten atoms has a binding energy of 69.5, this means that a cathode filament electron needs an energy of at least 70 kV to eject a K-shell electron on the anode target and produce characteristic photons. This means that with anodes made of tungsten, using a KV of less than 70, will produce bromstrahling X-ray photons. Also worthy of mentioning is the fact that unlike in bromstrahling photon production, multiple interactions do not occur in this process. This means that characteristic X-ray photon production gives off a homogeneous spectrum. The homogeneous spectrum simply implies that if a radiographer uses a kilovoltage of 78 this time, the characteristic X-ray photons in the beam produced will all possess an energy of 78 kilovolts. This is in fact why they bear the name characteristic X-ray photons, the energy they possess is a characteristic of the kilovoltage selected by the radiographer. They represent the energy of the incoming electrons. So far, we have looked at the two processes through which X-ray photons can be produced. Now, let us look at the common process by which these produced photons interact with the patient's anatomy to produce an X-ray image. The first process of interaction that we'd be looking at is the photoelectric effect or photoelectric absorption. This occurs between the produced X-ray photon and an electron that is orbiting the K-shell of atom in the patient's anatomy. In this process, the incoming X-ray photon ejects the K-shell electron. After using most of its energy to eject the K-shell electron, the photon does not have enough energy to leave the anatomy's atom. It is thus absorbed completely by the atom. Take note that this interaction will occur only when the photon energy is slightly greater than the binding energy of the K-shell electron. In a way, we have explained why this is so. When the photon energy is only slightly greater than the binding energy of the K-shell electron, the photon only has sufficient energy to eject the electron, the photon does not have enough energy to leave the atom after spending all that energy to eject the K-shell electron. It is thus absorbed by the atom. This explains the name photoelectric absorption. Also, the greater the atomic number of the anatomy, the greater the chance of photoelectric effect occurring. This is because atoms with high atomic number have more electrons, giving the photon a higher chance of running into and interacting with an electron. A good example of this is bones, which are made of calcium, an element with a high atomic number. You would have noticed that X-rays are greatly absorbed by bones. This is photoelectric absorption occurring. Also like we have mentioned, the photon does not leave the patient's anatomy. This is what makes photoelectric effect the interaction that is responsible for the radiation dose received by the patient. Another type of interaction that can occur between a photon and a patient is the Compton scatter. It occurs between a produced X-ray photon and this time, an outer shell electron on the anatomy. In Compton scatter, the incoming X-ray photon, which is a higher energy than in photoelectric effect, will eject an outer shell electron and still have enough energy to be deflected out of the atom and out of the patient's body. Like we have stated, for this interaction to occur, the incoming X-ray photon must have an energy that is much greater than the binding energy of the outer shell of the patient's atom. This way, the photon can eject the orbital electron and still have enough energy to leave the atom and the patient's body. The chances of this interaction occurring is dependent on the density of the patient's anatomy and the energy of the incoming photon. This means that it will occur more commonly in thicker anatomy and with high-energy photons. Like we have also stated, the X-ray photon leaves the patient's body. This means that Compton scatter interactions do not contribute to the dose of radiation that the patient receives. However, because the photon is deflected out of the patient's body, it can fog the image receptor with useless densities that do not accurately represent the anatomy, or, it can be deflected and be absorbed by whoever is near the patient during the procedure. This explains why Compton scatter forms most of the radiation that radiographers receive during a procedure. Photoelectric effect and Compton scatter are the two common interactions that occur in diagnostic radiography. There are other interactions, but these do not occur at the energy used in diagnostic radiography. Let us conclude by looking briefly at these types of interactions. First is the coherent scatter, also known as the classical or Rayleigh or Thompson scatter. In this type of interaction, the incoming photon has an extremely low energy. 
When it gets to the anatomy, it only passes near an outer shell electron, it doesn't eject it, it only causes it to vibrate for a short while. Eventually, the vibrating electron returns to its normal state, but as it does so, it would emit an X-ray photon of the same energy as the incoming X-ray photon. This is the only type of interaction that does not involve ionization. What happens here is known as excitation. Next is pair production. In this, the incoming photon has an extremely high energy, much higher than that used in conventional diagnostic radiography. This photon passes its energy to the nucleus of an atom. This causes the nucleus to produce a pair of subatomic particles. One positron and one electron. The next type of interaction also occurs at extremely high photon energy. It is known as photodisintegration. In this the photon is absorbed by the nucleus of an atom, and this causes the nucleus to break down and release its subatomic particles. That concludes this video on X-ray photon production and interaction. We look forward to your questions and comments in the comments section or via email. If you love this video and would want more content, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Until next time, do enjoy the learning process and take care.